Okay. So, so I guess we start off, right? I wanted to talk about how do we get to where we are today. There are actually some inherent problems with the China, China high yield sector that has been reversed for a long time. One of them is the structural subordination problem. So like when people invest in the Chinese offshore bonds, right? You're actually getting a bond that is issued by an offshore entity and you don't get to touch the asset and the cash flow of the underlying business. And secondly, there's a reliance on refinancing for bond repayment. Um, what that means is that uh, if you look at the history of the China high yield bonds, right? Typically, invest in the bond, uh, the proceeds was invested into equity of the onshore company, and they never really need to repatriate the cash offshore to actually repay you because they just issue a new bond, uh, they issue a new bond to repay the original bond and probably on, on, on a coupon. So all this means is that it is a very unfriendly kind of structure when it comes to restructuring, but during good times, there's no problem. So why wasn't it a problem before? Um, if you look at a lot of these like China high yield bonds, especially in the public sector, when they first get issued about a decade ago, a lot of them is coming up with a yield of about like 10%, 12%. These are arguably very attractive yield for kind of the, the risk you are taking. And at the same time, we are seeing very strong growth in the China public sector that drive along with this very strong economic growth. If you look at 2005, the annual sales in China is only 1 trillion RMB. And last year, it's already 16 trillion RMB. So the growth is phenomenal. And also, like offshore refinancing was never an issue. We was in the period of QD. There's plenty of money chasing after good returns. And this is a space that never really defaulted until last year. So why is it a problem now? I think that China is starting to realize that the rising property price is a problem. So it started policy a few years ago to ring in the property prices and excessive leverage. So what that does is that's turning the sector into a downturn. At the same time, the US dollar bond market is shut for new issuance. So basically a lot of the existing bond issues couldn't get refinancing to pay off the old bonds. So you're seeing them defaulting one by one. So what's next? I think that in the near term, I'm actually kind of cautious about the sector. One of the reasons is that if you look at the public sales growth, it has been negative since the middle of 2021. As a matter of fact, if you look at the sales growth for the whole country last month, it was actually minus 48%. So we haven't really seen a turnaround of the sector yet. Yet, the government policies is turning more positive. They are encouraging more sales. They are, they are lowering the mortgage rate for first-time home buyers. So this positive signs that we are seeing. And liquidity remains actually tight for most developers. But in the longer term, I would think that it probably remains a key pillar of the Chinese economy, accounting for over 30% of GDP. So I see that the current shakeup of the sector as a necessary and healthy development for sustainable long-term growth. And many of the public developers will survive in one form or another. So that creates a lot of investment opportunities. So the million dollar question is like, what are the actionable investment opportunities that we are seeing right now? I'm going to present two separate themes or two separate ideas today. One is more for the near term and one is more for the longer term. I guess in the near term, right, there's a lot of long short trading opportunities and in the longer term, there's distressed investment opportunities. So first on the long short trading opportunities, the first thing I would like to say is that at this time, right, it's hard to be very bullish about the sector, given that the outlook is still very murky. But at the same time, it's very hard to be outright bearish because the valuation has corrected so much, right? So, I mean, it's hard to have a directional view on the entire sector. And I think that if we have a long short trading strategies where we keep a kind of like neutral to a short bias exposure in the sector while picking the disparity within the sector, is a good way to generate alpha in this sector. I guess the first short kind of idea that I have is that there's actually a lot of disparity in the bond prices of this space. There are all these uh, performing bonds, performing bonds trading in the 80s to 90s, and there's a whole bunch of names in the 40s to 50s, and there's some default names kind of below 20s. My thing is that this disparity is actually creating a lot of short opportunities. Because when I look at the space, right, a lot of them are facing the same fundamental issues. Of course, their credit quality kind of varies from one to another. But the biggest problem they're seeing is that there's a severe downturn of the property sales. And then there's a shutdown of the US dollar market. So even the best developer in the space, right, if they cannot access the US dollar refinancing market, and if property sales is keep on going down 50% per year, even the best one could not actually refinance. So why is there such a disparity in the bond prices? I think there are two reasons, right? Because there are some bonds that issuers that actually was facing maturity earlier than the others. A lot of them have maturities end of last year or early this year. So they defaulted already. And for the other ones, a lot of them might have maturities later this year or maybe early next year, right? 
they are still performing, but they haven't got to the stage of a maturity war. So that's why their bonds are holding tight. But if push comes to shove, they could have problems as well. The second reason is actually more technical. There's a lot of uh, real money kind of long only kind of investors that focus on the chat as obvious sector. So they couldn't hold the defaulted bonds. So when the defaulted bonds kind of get sold off, right, they have to sell them and then the proceeds in to be invested into the higher quality bonds. So that kind of push up the prices of the high quality bonds and push down the price of the defaulted ones. I think that these are the technicals, but the thing is that when fundamental kicks in, right, a lot of the high dollar price is going to suffer as well. So this is one of my ideas to short the high dollar price one. But of course, you need to do the correct work to identify which one. The second uh, part of the uh, kind of long-term strategy is that we need to long bonds, right, to offset our short exposure. I think that when people long kind of bonds, that is distressed, right? You kind of look at whether a company is more likely to survive or not, right? People look at better asset qualities, maybe look at maybe they have better financial management. But I think that all these are pretty standard. People look at all these kind of factors to actually think about what to buy or not. What I would focus on is that I would actually focus a lot of the level of sponsorship. What I mean is that if you look at certain, in China, relationship is very important. So if you have good relationship with the government or the banks, right, a lot of the refinancing problem onshore gets sorted out. So if let's say a company is actually located in a region or in a province where it's actually the biggest taxpayers to the government or it has a kind of is the biggest client of a bank, right? It's more likely that they're going to get some form of a sponsorship from the local government or the banks, right? And this would help them to actually resolve some of the refinancing issues. So in this sense, I, I would focus on whether individual companies have this kind of sponsorship. And as a rule of thumb, right, usually the kind of regional players who are kind of very big in the region have that kind of sponsorship. But if we talk about a nationwide kind of developers with an operation all over the space, right, then basically no single provincial government or no single bank is kind of their sponsor. So if there's a kind of the difficulties in refinancing, it's actually very hard for them to have a cohesive plan to actually rescue the company. So, so these are the framework I would think about when I pick up the short and the long candidates. So moving along to the longer term investment ideas, right? I think that in the longer term, distress is actually the biggest idea. Because when I think about the profit space problem we are having, right? It's not fraud or it's not any kind of misuse of money or anything like that, right? We are just caught in a cycle when there's a very sharp downturn in property sales and the offshore refinancing market got frozen up. So none of these developers can actually get the cash flow to refinance the existing bonds that they do. At the same time, they have a lot of uh, kind of debt that is still, right? So I would see that more of a problem of asset versus liability problem. You have a lot of near-term liabilities you have to pay, right? But the asset are all the prop property projects you have onshore, which take years for you to actually develop and build and kind of get the cash. So the thing is that as a distressed investment, right? Uh, we really have to have a mindset that for the companies that are going to be going concerned, they will survive this kind of a problem in the longer term. Once they settle all the onshore problems, once the sales pick up again, and they actually earn profit again from their projects, they would have the surplus cash to repatriate offshore to repay the US dollar bonds. But it's going to take time. It's not going to be just a one year or half year thing. So, but the thing is that if you are looking at bonds that are trading at five cents to the dollar, 10 cents to the dollar, there's enormous opportunities. I mean, there, there's, I think that a lot of these developers is going to survive in the longer end. The challenge that I'm seeing is that there's actually a lack of a legal framework for holistic onshore and offshore restructuring right now. But I think that these are things that we need to be sorted out over time. The key question about distress investing is that people ask me all the time is, what's the right timing? Like, when, when do you start, start going in? Do you go in now? And how do you pick the right candidates? So I'm just going to give you a framework of how I think about it. I think timing, you really need the physical market to recover. The reason is that for successful restructuring, you need alignment of interest. You need the business owner of the developer, the chairman, to have the motivation and the incentive to actually do a deal with you, right? If he couldn't see a future in his own business, he wouldn't cut a deal with you. So you need the physical market to recover for him to actually see a future in the business and then he's going to cut a deal with the creditors for a win-win situation. So I would think that right now we are still seeing some kind of 50% year over year decline in the property sales, right? But I would expect the property sales to moderate and kind of improve sometime next year. So I think that from now to kind of a year from now, 
is about a good time to start seriously looking at uh, the US investments. And the second question is that, how do we pick the right candidates? There, there's so many developers. I, I mentioned that more than 20 has defaulted. So among the 20, like, which one do I pick? I mean, it comes down to an individual credit world because it's not that easy to identify which one is the one that's going to survive. But I can give you like a framework, a very simplified framework of how I would group these developers. I, I look at two dimensions. I think one dimension is that the years of operation, and the years of being a listed company, right? And the other dimension is that the likelihood of a government involvement in the restructure. I would tend to be like the companies where there's a certain like kind of 10 or more years of operation and of being a listed company. There's two very simple reasons. If the chairman, if the company has been listed for 10 years, right? I assume the chairman has been getting a lot of dividends over time. Personally, he's quite wealthy already. And he's quite keen to actually preserve his list code, his wealth. And he has actually money to bail out the company if needed. Rather, if you talk about companies that are just listed for one year, two years, most likely the chairman haven't accumulated enough wealth to actually do any kind of rescue and he would just give up. So I, and second, for companies that have been running for a long time, right? Most likely they have bought a lot of land bank cheap in the central areas close to downtown or something like that. For companies that just got listed recently, most likely they bought a lot of expensive land bank in tier three, four cities, which they cannot regulate. So in this aspect, I would actually prefer companies that has been running for reasonably long time. The other dimension is the likelihood of government involvement. I think that what I prefer is that this medium level of government involvement. And why is that? I actually want to avoid the one with very low or very high level of government involvement because for the very low level of government involvement, it means that company is actually not important. It's unlikely to get any government support for them to actually uh, discuss refinancing onshore and talking with the local banks. But for the one that is very systematically important, that are very much getting involvement from the government, it's likely that the government is going to take over the whole discussion and the whole restructuring. And as I mentioned before, for a successful restructuring, you need alignment of interest. You need to align your- Sorry, Leo, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to jump your way over time. Oh, okay. We, okay. we, we want to give our allocator panel a chance to ask more succinct questions, but you are actually in a really, really interesting topic there on on the uh, more of the due diligence side, which I thought was very, very fascinating. Giovanni, I think we have only about five minutes for uh, the questions. So you have the floor. Perfect. Thank you, Alvin. And thank you, Leo, for a very, very interesting presentation on a topic that is crucial, not just to domestic investors, but also to international ones. It's a very, very, you're given very, very clear ways of reading this. And I noted that the poll that we put out there is a question to our audience of whether the China property bonds at bottom see the majority of people who have answered saying that they have not. So there's still concern, I guess, in the audience for the sector. And let me start it from there. You talked about a fair amount of damage being done to the offshore bond market specifically and by reflection to the property sector in China. Is there a future for the offshore bond market for Chinese bonds? Or shall we start to focus on domestic alternatives by bond connected or dedicated funds? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that there's definitely a future for the China offshore bonds. I think that uh, a lot of the damage that we have seen is actually on the property sector, right? So it's not universal to all kind of uh, China uh, higher bonds. I think that uh, I mentioned that one of the problems inherent with the China higher bonds is uh, structural subordination. But actually, this is not a kind of uh, problem that is unique in China. If you look at a lot of the uh, kind of Indian higher bonds and some other regions, right, they have similar sort of uh, restriction about investing onshore, and thus uh, the structure they come up with have this kind of uh, structural subordination. I think that uh, going forward, I don't think this kind of structure is going to change. I think that uh, we are going to see more bonds using this structure. And I actually think that with this kind of shake up that we are seeing in the uh, restructuring, right, we are going to set some precedents about the restructuring that we are seeing for this China higher structure. So with some of the restructuring being finished and kind of completed, uh, people can get a sense of how things will be done going forward. And that gives them a better sense of how to price the risk going forward. So I think that this structure is going to continue going forward. And as to your questions about whether we should uh, focus on the onshore market, I think onshore market is a very big opportunity I think that right now uh, it's actually one of the largest bond market in the world. One of the issues is that we, you can access using Bond Connect or you can access, you can actually put cash uh, onshore, right? 
But the liquidity that we are seeing on show is actually not as good for now, right? But I think that this is an area that has a lot of potential going forward. So, so until I guess uh, until China one day decided that they want to like take away their capital control, right? I think that both the onshore market and the offshore bond market will still uh, coexist. Thank you. I want to pick up on uh, things that you said towards the end of your talk, and you mentioned the government. This is another thing that, or the government involvement in the restructuring phase, is another thing that, from a international allocator, maybe is you know could generate a bit of confusion. Why? My question is why. Would the government involvement in the process being seen, Chinese government involvement in the process being seen as a positive or a negative? And regardless of that, how do you get the blessings of the government if and when they push forward for one? Okay, then let me just clarify my the point I was trying to make. I think that it's important to get the government support in the restructuring because usually, right? Because because when we do any restructuring of the higher bonds, right? It's not just the offshore bond higher bonds that you have to restructure. You have to remember that usually, right, in the whole capital structure, right, you have a lot of like contractors, suppliers of the developers in onshore, and then you have a whole bunch of bank loans, and then you have at, at the onshore company level, they might have all the trust loans, the bank financing, and a lot of wealth management products. So the thing is that having government support is essential to actually push forward a lot of this restructuring. What I mean is that if we get too much government interference in the restructuring, that's actually bad. And what I mean is that, for example, right, let's say that the, comp- the government decided that this company is too systematically important. They want to take over the company and actually restructure the company, right? Usually what that entails is that they're going to kick out the original owner, the original owner won't get anything. They're going to kick out the management team. They're going to install their own management team, right? In that kind of scenario, the problem is that if the original owner is no longer in the company, right? It doesn't create a lot of incentive for them to actually enter into a friendly negotiation with offshore creditors because there's no historical baggage for the new coming guys who is appointed by the government. And when the government actually do a lot of their work, right, it's probably more focusing on ensuring the welfare and the social stability of the domestic kind of audience rather than the welfare of the offshore creditors. So the, the, and another thing is that when the government actually design things, right, once they get decided, there's very little room to negotiate. But if you have the original owner who is doing the negotiation with you, right, there's actually more room for you to have proposal going back and forth. So what the what, so, so I think that the sweet spot for the restructuring is that it's a company that actually have the support of the government, but the government doesn't come in and interfere with the restructuring process. That would be the ideal case for a successful restructuring candidate. Lovely, thank you. If the chairman allows me, I know we are close on time. If the chairman allows me one quick question, additional question, I would ask you the following. You've given us a very good template, I think, to navigate through uh, the good and the bad ones in the current situation. And can you give us a specific example? You want to pick an example of a company where you can either profit on the long side or profit on the short side. Uh, based on the price differential and the opportunities that you described? I guess without going into specific names, I think that in the current environment, as I mentioned, right, there's a lot of names that are kind of trading at very high dollar price versus some of the similar names that are trading at very low dollar price. right? The only difference between them is that the one that's trading at a very low dollar price has defaulted, the one that is trading at a high, very high dollar price haven't defaulted. But you have to remember, right? if you go back 10, maybe one year ago, all these bonds, right? They were trading all at the roughly same range. Let's say 80 to 90 to a par, right? That's the range they're trading, right? Now they are trading at range of, okay, some of them is in the 20s, some of them is uh, in, the, in the 80s, right? So, so my argument is that, I mean, from a credit fundamental perspective, they haven't really, there's, there's actually not that many differences, right? It's more like the fundamental because say one of them have defaulted, one of them doesn't have such an imminent maturity, they haven't defaulted. But I would argue that probably, if the current environment goes on, right? If the offshore market remains shut, and then if the uh, if the sales remains weak, they still couldn't repay the US dollar bonds. So, so this is kind of the dynamics that I'm talking about, where it would create a very obvious uh, kind of arbitrage, or maybe a very obvious short opportunity for you to short the very high dollar price ones. Thank you, Leo. I think this is all we have uh, time for. I'll give the word back to our chairman. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Thank you so much, Leo, for coming by. It's been actually really thrilling stuff, especially given where we are in the market today. Let's chat again soon. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.